All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our hearts, our lives, in our church, in our families. God, we thank you, Father, from the tops of our head to the soles of our feet. We thank you that your healing power flows into our body. Every sickness, every disease, every germ in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you. We thank you for divine health. We thank you for healing. We bless you and we magnify you today. Give us eyes and ears and hearts to receive today what you have for us in this place. We honor you today. Thank you, thank you, thank you for setting us free. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins and preparing a place for us that we can spend eternity with you. We bless you and we honor you. If you agreed with that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. amen. All right. So we're talking about, this is week three, of, uh, and I've decided, to, I said this might be my last week, but I've decided to make it a 12-week series. There's some other stuff that we need to talk about in the church. I'm just kidding again. <laughs> it's flowing in a joke today. But uh, we're talking about, really, we've been talking about the last couple of weeks about this amazing, wonderful, fantastic thing called the church. This thing that Jesus died for, this thing that Jesus said that he would build in the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Amen? This thing that God says is his very own family. That's what the Word of God says about the church. We talked about last week about what matters most. And I would, if, if you had probably just asked me that question right off the top of my head, I would have said, well, faith matters the most because without faith, we can't please God. We walk by faith. We live by faith. Faith has got to be the most important thing. But we read this verse last week, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, says this, the only thing that counts is faith, didn't stop there, is faith expressing itself through love. Faith expressing itself through love. There's a, another version of that, and I think it's the King James says that your faith, it says faith worketh by love. I tell you, if, if faith's not working for you, I would suggest this to you. The first place that you look is check out your love walk. Because that's the first place that I go. When it seems like and I'm praying and I'm believing for something and I'm not seeing anything happen, first place I look, and nine times out of ten, it's a, there's, a, a, there's some unforgiveness somewhere, there's some just not walking in love, maybe I said something or did something, or said, you know, maybe I said something to a guy that wouldn't turn right on red or light, you know, I called him an idiot, and, uh, and so there's just things that I just need to get right. <laughs> so again, you know, honestly, honestly, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us, and when we do, again, it's that, uh, that inventory verse, and uh, Psalms 139, David said, Father, search my heart. If there's anything, if there's any wicked way in me, show me. Show me. I want to get those things right. And so when we do that, when we're talking about we've got some, some deficiencies in our love walk, if we ask the Holy Spirit, he'll tell us. He'll point those things to us. And it don't go, we don't go, oh, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. Let's take it on the next step and repent. Repent and, and not and purpose. We purpose not to do that. And I purpose to be a better, kinder driver. And I, will I fail again? Paula said, mm -mm, I ain't saying. <laughs> She's not speaking that over me. Good job, wife. That was a test for you. All right. So again, so check out your love walk. I love this verse. I love this verse in the Message Bible when we're talking about love. Is it says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse 3. The Message Bible again says, no matter, what I, no matter what I say, no matter what I believe, no matter what I do, I am bankrupt without love. That is so true. Man, what a great verse. I am bankrupt without love. Doesn't matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do. I like that. Remember, Jesus identified what? It, he said, and by this will all men know that you're my disciples. By your faith, by how many scriptures that you memorize, by how many days you go to church, how many weeks you go to church without missing, how many years you've gone to church without missing. Will that how people will know that we're his disciples? No, it says by love. By love, John 13, verse 34 and verse 35. For several... Um, Several weeks, I guess it's months, I guess it says, say, we had a billboard out there and it said, better together, kind of what it said today on that screen. So we know that that video got it from us. <laughs> I think City Gate Church, we originated that better together, amen? And, uh, but we believe that. I really believe, firmly believe again that we are, we are better together. Now, these passages that I talked about really for the last two weeks, it wasn't really passages because we didn't read the passage. We, read the, we, we said that there's over 50, or maybe I think I said the number was 56. There's over 56 instances of where the phrase one another or each other is mentioned in the New Testament. And again, it was for just to give me an example, encourage each other, admonish each other, greet, teach, accept, serve, honor, bear one another, forgive one another, submit one to another, be devoted one to another. All of these verses, notice something the common denominator has is there are things that you can't do by yourself. 
You can't do one another, each other things by yourself. We need other people to do, what, again, what God wants us to do. Listen to this verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Again, this is out of the message as well. It said, it's better to have a partner than to go it alone. Share the work, share the wealth. And if one falls down, the other can help. But if there's no one to help, tough. I like the way the message says that, tough. That's just tough. Verse 11 says this, two in bed, warm each other. Alone, you shiver all night. By yourselves, you, you're, un, by yourselves you're unprotected. With a friend, uh, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-fold strand of, strand of rope is not easily snapped. Well, can you round up a third? How about a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and a seventh? How about get about eight people? Can you imagine what a cord that strong would be like? But again, I keep referring to these, I keep referring to these, these each other, these each other verses. Um, and I said this last week, I said that this week I was going to tell you where that, those verses, where the, what kind of environment they flourish in the most. They're more prone to, to be successful in doing. I told you, remember you me telling you that last week, that I was going to tell you this week? You, you remember that, right? Yeah. Yes, just, just say yeah. Make me feel better if you said yes. Now, I would have no, I have no doubt in believing that's probably, we have some pretty, a lot of rain coming down in early this morning coming. I have no doubt that some of you pressed through, pressed through, went to your cars and got wet because you wanted to know that answer, right? That's right, Pastor. So we're, you're, all right, so you're, you're, you're holding out. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm going to drag it out just a little bit longer. Let me read you one more verse here. I love this verse. And again, this is out of the God's Word translation. Uh, it says, uh, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews 10, 23. says, we must continue to, we must continue to hold firmly to our declaration of faith. In other words, you've heard this in another more familiar sound. Hold fast to your confession of faith. Hold on to our, to our faith. Verse 24 says, we must consider how to encourage one another or how to encourage each other. See, that's again, that's one of those 50 plus verses or 56 verses that we've talked about encourage one another to show love and to do good things verse 25 says this now watch this we should not stop gathering together with the believers as some of you are doing we must not stop gathering together we must not let's just put it in, in, in today's vernacular we don't stop going to church as some people have remember i started this whole series out with it to me a very depressing statistic that only one third only one third of americans uh, go to church on a weekly basis. One third. That's that's on a country that was founded on Judeo-Christian values, and back in the back in the early you know fifties and forties, I mean it was like seventy percent, and now it's just, why why are people leaving the church? Why are people why are they leaving the church? And it says again, encourage each other even more as we see the the day of the Lord approaching, as we see the, Jesus Christ coming back for His church when we see the rapture of the church. I'm telling you, if there's a time that people ought to be coming to church, it ought to be now. But we've got people in the church that are leaving the church. Listen to what it says in, uh, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Again, the Message Bible. So here's what I want you to do. When you gather for worship, now let me just say something about that. When you gather for worship, that's not necessarily just talking about when you come to the worship. Well, we just finished the worship portion of our, of our service, and now we're getting into the sharing of the word. Sometimes we think that, but worship is not an act. It's not a single act that we do. Worship is obedience to God. When we, when we live our life, we're, we're living a life of obedience. I remember, remember when Abraham was, was challenged and was tested by God to take his son Isaac to the mountain of Moriah. He said, a mountain I'll show you about when you get there and sacrifice your son there. And he went there and he did it. And he told, them, he told the, the, the men that were with them on this journey, when they got there to the mountain, he said, you guys stay here while I and the lad will go up there and worship. And he didn't say, and Larry, if you'll bring the harmonica and some of you bring that little tambourine thing over there, we'll go up there, we're going to worship. They didn't go up there and him and, 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 and I didn't go up there and just and have a kumbaya and sing it. It was their act of worship. It was what he was doing. Our worship is our act of worship. It's a lifestyle. Worship is a lifestyle. It's not a, a 20 minute, 30 minute portion of a service on Sunday morning. When you, so, so, so it's again, so we're back in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. When you gather for worship, each one of you should prepare something that will be useful for all. Sing a hymn. Today we'd say, sing a song. 
teach a lesson, tell a story, lead a prayer, provide them some insight. Verse 30 says, take your turn, no one taking over. In other words, don't nobody just kind of ramrod it and take, take over the thing. He said, then each speaker gets a chance to share something special from God, and we all learn from each other. Now, honestly, 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 does that sound like to you what's happening this morning? Does it? I mean, does it, it, anybody got a song today? We, you know, Jackie didn't come up here. She had some selected songs that she chose. She didn't at any point say, anybody, anybody else got a song? You got a song? Come on, come up, come up and sing that, lead us in that song. Anybody do that? Anybody got a poem? Anybody got a poem today? Anybody got a, anybody got a testimony? Of, now, now, we do that from time to time. We, we did it a few weeks ago uh, when we had the, the Daniel fast. After we were done, we had about 10 people up here or so, seven or eight, 10, somewhere in that number. They were testifying and telling about their experience. We, uh, a lot of times around Thanksgiving, we'll have people that will come up and just share, just, just what are you thankful for? And those, those times, but, but not, a, not on a typical Sunday morning, is it? That's not, again, what we do on a typical Sunday morning. So the best place, here's the answer to the question. Here's what I tell you. Is, where does these scriptures, each other and one another, where's the environment that it happens the best? It's in a small group. Here at City Gate Church, we call them connect groups. We used to call them life groups. A lot of churches use, use life groups. Again, they're just they're small groups. Listen, the temple was for worship. The house was for fellowship. And we need both to be a balanced believer. We need church. We've talked about this the last couple of weeks, how important church is. It's so important. It's so important. And it, it, I don't know if I can say it this, but I'm, I'm going to say it. It might not be right, but I'm going to say it. And if you have children, especially small children, it's so important that you bring your children and raise them up in church. It's so, so, so important. Because if you don't, if you don't raise them in church, do you think they're going to raise their kids in church? Probably not. It's so important that we raise our children. There's a responsibility that we have as parents to train up a child in the way that they should go. You could almost say that would be the directions to the church. Honey, you go this way and you go this way and you go, that's the way that they should go. They should go in the way of the church. So don't miss this. Those one another and each other verses are most effective in a small group environment. A small group environment. Here's what God wants every believer to do. Every believer, he wants you to do this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, New Living Translation. He says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. And each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow. So that the whole body, and the two things here, there's really three, but it's two, healthy and growing and full of love. I guess there's three, but really if something's healthy, it will be growing, right? If a, if a child is healthy, then there, are, there ought to be a natural growth process. So healthy and growing. This is God's will for us that he wants all of us healthy and growing and full of love. And a and genuine fellowship, a genuine community has its best opportunity to flourish in a small group environment. Mm. Okay. Now, I know more of you that go, do you, how many of you go to, you got a, you got a connect group? You go, did you enjoy it? Okay. Both of you. All right. Good. <laughs> All right. Do you, do you enjoy it? Yes. 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 I didn't, you know what? I've got a small group. I didn't say anything either, so. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, it's awesome. We love it. Listen, community happens again when you get four to six. To, really, we like to say about 12. Between six and 12 people. Because sometimes when you get too many people, people will shut up. But in a smaller number of people, more people are prone to open up and share a poem, share a story, share a testimony, share a prayer request of what's going on. You get too many people and people get scared. They get scared. Look at... Uh, this verse, uh, this was again from last week's verse. Again, I just, I love it. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. It, talking about love, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And the reason I say that, right on the heels of what I just said about small group, it's important that we have an, a protective atmosphere in a small group, that people can feel that they feel like they can come and that they can share. Isn't that right? I heard a story about three pastors the, they were all from the same town, and they would get together periodically, and they would do things together in the name of friendship and stuff. And so they were fishing one time, and uh, and and the uh, one of the pastors, in the name of uh, transparency and and openness, suggested he says, "Let's share what our greatest struggle is. What do we struggle with the most?" 
And the first guy said, well, I'll go first. And he says, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say this as a, as a pastor, uh, but he said, I, I struggle with money and greed. I just tell you, it's, uh, sometimes money controls me, and it's just, uh, I, I know it's not a good thing. And the other two guys shook their heads and said, yeah, well, we'll, 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 we pre, we pray, we're praying with you. you know, then he says, well, thank you. And then the next pastor says, well, again, as a pastor, and I know, I know better as well, but he said, I struggle with lust. And uh, I just, you know, I, I have difficulty when I see a, a pretty woman that I, sometimes my mind goes in places that I don't take captive that thought. And it's just, it's something that I, that I really struggle with. And they said, oh, that's, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be praying with you. And the third pastor said, you know, kind of like you guys, I, I got something, I'm not, I'm not proud of this, but I got a problem with gossip. Ching! <laughs> 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 He gossips, and he just got through hearing some juicy morsels. He might go tell somebody. And by the way, he had to go right after he said that. He had to leave for some reason. That, that, that went over a whole lot better in my mind. <laughs> I don't know. Some of you judgmental people are thinking those pastors that are in greed and lust. You couldn't get past that. Listen, but listen, nothing destroys, nothing destroys a church, nothing destroys a small group, whether it's called a connect group or a life group, more than gossip. The Bible says, God says there are six things that, uh, in Proverbs chapter 6, six things that the, that's the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination. And one of those is hands, uh, be feet that be swift to run to mischief, a proud, a haughty look. And there's one that says, uh, he that soweth discord among the brethren. That discord is just gossip. God hates gossip because what it does to his church. Again, the truth is that some people grow up in families, again, where they have very unhealthy relationships. They were very unhealthy relationships, and they lack good relational skills needed for authentic fellowship or authentic relationships. And there's a lot of people that have no one who loves them enough to tell them the truth, especially when they're telling somebody, that person, the truth, that it's, it's going to be hard. It's a hard thing to tell them. And, uh, you know, we all just kind of want to go along and kind of get along. But sometimes we need to have conversations with people that they're doing, they're saying, they're talking about. We need to be able to, to tell them in love, that's not good. And it's always good to have scriptural background when we, when we confront people with those things. Proverbs 24, verse 26 says this, an honest answer is a sign of a true friendship. Pooh, that's true. I mean, just something as simple as you got some lettuce in your teeth. You know, you can have lunch with some people, they won't say anything. And you get in the car and you look up and you go, oh my God, why did they say something to me? Or you know, your pants unzip or a booger in your nose or something like that. People, they just look away. They won't, they won't, <laughs> they, they won't, they won't say anything. Let me give you, let me give you three good, <laughs> let me give you three good reasons why you should wipe your nose before you go to lunch with somebody. No, I'm just kidding. I want to give you three reasons why every believer should go to church and you should be a part of a small group. Number one is this. You ready? ready? Number one. Here we go. Three reasons. Number one. Now, I'm going to take, 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 take this in first person. This is, this is me because I need these. I need these. And guess what? At the end of each one, you can say, uh, me too. This is the original me too movement right here. <laughs> All right. Number one is this. I need others. I need others to walk with me and to help me grow. I need others to help me, help me. And, and will help me to grow. Now look at somebody and point to them and say, you need that too. Now you can actually hit yourself on your chest while you got that long bony finger sticking out and hit yourself and say, yeah, me too. All right, listen, listen, without question, without a question, it's God's will that we grow in our relationship with him, with the Lord Jesus Christ and with his church. And that when we talk about growing in our relationship, we're talking about growing in our walk with him. Many of you are familiar with the, this this passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter 4. This is when the Bible says that when Jesus, not that he just uh, descended, but he also ascended and he gave gifts unto men. Here's what it says in the Message Bible. It says, and talk about Jesus, says he filled the earth with his gifts. He handed out gifts to the gifts of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Verse 12 says, to train up Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within Christ's body, the church. Verse 13, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other, efficiently and graceful in response to God's Son, fully mature adults, fully developed within and without, fully alive, uh, fully alive like Christ. 
How many of you know this, that the Christian walk is not, it's not, it's not a, a thing that we, just, we get saved and we just sit down. And we just, well, we're saved, we don't do anything, but it's a, it's a journey. It's a walk. Listen, the Bible talks about walking in light, walking in love, walking in obedience, walking in, uh, walking in the Spirit, walking in wisdom. And we do have one passage where, where Paul says that I run the race to finish the race, but it's moving. God never intended us to walk this or to, to get up and walk this walk by ourselves. In fact, again, we know this in Genesis 2.18. It says that it's not good for man to be alone. So he created him a helpmate. We need people. We need people, again, to help us. God created two groups of people. Two, I could say it this way. God created two families. The first one is this, our physical family. It's a family that we grow up in, and eventually we leave. There's some of you that got some adult children still at home, and you're saying, Amen! <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, 24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and, and uh, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So in families, in the natural family, that doesn't mean we, we never talk to them. We have, we have great relationships with them. But again, it's a, there's a time of leaving and cleaving. Amen? Teaching my kids that now. And then the second family is a spiritual family. And again, that's the one that we live our life in. And we'll, this will be forever. We'll always be in a, whether we're here on earth or the, our family in heaven. We're together. Again, we live and to help each other, to support each other in our call and our purpose and what God has for us to do. So again, number one was this. I need people to walk with me and to help me grow. And so do you. And the two, second one is this. I need people to work with me, to work with me and to help me accomplish what God has called me to do. And so do you. We need that. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship. We're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Every one of us have good works that God has prepared before you were ever even thought of. Before the foundation of the world, God knew you would be here and he called you. He's created good things for you to do. The work again that he's called us to do is too big for us to do alone. I can't do what I do alone. Jackie's a good singer, but she can't do it. She could. She could come up here. She could actually probably play the keyboard and lead worship, but not to the level and create the environment by herself that she can do with the team of people that she surrounded herself with. She needs someone. She needs some help. God knows. I mean, God knows you need the help, so he's going to send you more people. That's what I meant. Okay. I'd be careful with that. Then it came out wrong at first, Jackie. So listen, we're, t- we're talking about three reasons why every believer should be where? In the, in the church, thank you. And also be in a small group, connect group, life group, whatever you want to call them. We don't care. Number three is this. I need others to watch out for me. I need others to watch out for me, and so do you. You need others to watch out for you as well. I need people who will, who will defend me, uh, people who will protect me, people who will stand up for me when I need standing power. Someone who will help me stay on track and, and warn me when I'm getting off track. We need people to watch out for us. And so do you. We need these things. I wonder how many people today aren't sure whether they were included. And in, I'm serious. I'm, how many, some, there's people that don't think they were included in Ephesians 2.10. That, what did God create me to do? I just, I just don't know. I don't, I don't know. But he did because the word says that he did. And you have a purpose. You have a call. And if you're not sure what your spiritual gifts are, you're not sure um, how, how to find that, let us know. We'll, we'll help you. In fact, in our, in our Connect class, one of the things we used to do is take a spiritual gift inventory class. And uh, we, don't, we don't, don't do that anymore. But we still have it available. So if you're here today, if you're online and you're saying, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. I don't know what my purpose is. Let us know. Let us know, and we'll, we'll put you in, in, uh, in contact with that. It's a, it's a very simple little form that you fill out and how to do it. And if you have any questions, I'm serious. I'm, I'm not joked around a lot today, but Jackie will, because she taught this on our, when we did it on our, in a part of our Connect, and she'll walk you through that. So, and if we get enough people this morning, if we had six or seven people that said, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to take that spiritual gift to inventory, we'll set up a time and we'll all do it together. But even if it's one person, if it's just one of you, all you got to do is let us know. You have to. This is very careful. You have to print very legibly your name and your email address and say, I'm interested in finding my purpose. And, uh, and then we'll get, we'll get back with you with that, that link, okay? And it'll be good. It's, it'll be a good, good thing. Uh, 
I, I'll just give you this hint. I'll give you this hint. Your spiritual, uh, your call and your purpose is going to have something to do with your shape. <laughs> Seriously, it's going to have something to do with your shape. Now, I'm not talking about the mass of your body. I'm talking about your shape, your S-H-A-P-E. Now, this is not Rich Fennell. Rick Warren uh, came up with this. I thought it was brilliant. I love it. Our shape is this. Our shape is uh, spiritual gifts. God has given you spiritual gifts. You've just got to sometimes dis- find what they are, not you decide. He's already decided what they are, those spiritual gifts. Also, your heart. What has God put in your heart? How many of you have ever said this? I just felt led to do this. I just had it in my heart. Well, how did it get in your heart? God puts things on the inside of us. He puts that desire. Because remember, we, we talked about this, and sometimes we get this wrong, that God will give us the desires of our heart. That's not, well, God will just give me anything I want. God will give me the desires of my heart. God will put the desires that he wants me to do, because that's what I want. I don't want what Rich Fennell wants to do. I want God, I want your desire for me. And God says that he'll do that. So, so you'll have that passion, you'll have that uh, that's another word for the heart. Is you'll have that passion to do that. The, the, uh, the A is abilities. God gives you abilities and giftings. And, you know, that's one thing I love about a, a professional athlete that gives the, the, the credit and the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ for, you know, for, for, their, for their ability to do, you know, what seems like almost supernatural things. But it's, uh, it's amazing, again, how many of those guys are, are egotistical and it's all about them. But I love that when they, they, they identify it's Christ, my ability wasn't me. God gave me this gift and I'm going to use it for his glory to share with other people. And then the other one is uh, personality. It's just your personality. God will gift you with a personality. If you're kind of grumpy, it's not a gift. It's not a gift. It's just not a redeemed part, part of your flesh yet. You're probably not called, you're probably not gifted to be a, a greeter at the door. Right? right? Or if, if you're kind of, kind of, you know, just, you're kind of bold, you're kind of a, a um, uh, what's that, domineering, kind of a personality. I'm domineering in some ways, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's part of the, it's part of the personality profile. The D is, is direct and domineering. Sometimes I, I won't say, and it's good to know that. It's good to know that. So when the staff comes and they, and they say something to me, and I'm rah, 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 like that, oh, he's just domineering. Say they don't take it personally then because they know that's just my personality. Now, you can't get away with stuff like that all the time. You've got to, you've got to smooth those things out, right? You can't just be eh, to that way. What was I saying? Huh? You've got to be Christ-like. How did I get off on that? <laughs> personality, right? Yeah, personality. So, so, again, if you're kind of a grumpy, we don't want you working with the kids. So you're off. <laughs> you're off the hook there. We're not going to be asking you to go up and serve <laughs> with the kids. But there's people that actually have it in their heart. They actually have a gift to communicate to kids. And I am ever so thankful that they're today and, 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 and they're, they're back there today and they're teaching kids. You should have seen, man, they had those tables out, had all these papers out there. And they, they're, they're getting all the color and things ready. They're getting ready to draw some stuff. And I said, please draw some sunshine today. But they've got this plan and they, they, they're good at that and they're gifted at it. And, uh, you know, uh, Ken Boney, he was up here uh, doing something recently. It was for it was a Christmas program, wasn't it? Before. Before that, anyway, he was up here, and you saw he was he's gifted at, at communicating to kids, and it's a gift, and it's part of his personality. And the last thing is this: the E is this your experience? You just God just opens up opportunities for you to work in, in something in an area that later on you're in that area and because you've got that experience. God does that, and again, that's your shape. That's on the uh, the app in the notes, so make sure you. You get that and don't think I was talking about otherwise. Okay, listen to what this verse says. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, man, I'm running out of time. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 says this. It is he who saved us and chose us for his own, for his holy work, not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan long before the world began. So show his love and kindness to us, to show his love and kindness to us through Christ. So again, there's no doubt that everyone in here today, every one of you that are listening online, you have a plan, you have a purpose in your, on your life. You have a call on your life. And again, when I say a moment ago, when I said I need someone to watch out for me, or we need someone to watch out for, for all of us, I'm not just talking about watch out for danger, but when we're slacking off, when we're, when we're, not, being, when we're not doing what we should be doing. In other words, it's called holding people accountable. You know, sometimes if you have relationships with someone in the church and you haven't seen them for, for a while, uh, 
be a, make them, don't make them accountable, but just hold them accountable. Say, hey, where, where have you been? What's been going on? You may find out, man, they've been sick or something happened or whatever. Or you may find out that they're going to another church. Why would they go to another church? No. Um, <laughs> but if they did, again, at least, hey, okay, you're, you're in a church. I just was checking on. I just wanted to make sure. Do you understand? Hold people accountable. We're not getting on them. We're, that's what love would do. That's what love would do. Philippians 2, 4 says this. Don't be interested only in your own life, but be interested in the lives of others. How many of you, well, how, how many of you remember? You'd have to be really little not to remember this. 9-11, September the, huh? Oh, they got them up. Yay, good job. Let's that's, that's go to it right there, man. Let's keep working. <laughs> good, good sticking with it, guys. Let's start all over. <laughs> But you remember the, the horrible tragedy, September the 11th, uh, 2001. How many of you remember where you were? I was right up there in that hallway. I remember that. I think Paula was, there was a ladies' Bible study going on. But anyway, they commissioned a, a task force, and, uh, to, and they called it the 9-11 report. Let me just read you just a snippet of that report. This is the 9-11 report. It says, we learned about an enemy who is so sophisticated, patient, disciplined, and lethal. Boy, it sounds like the devil, doesn't it? See, the enemy rallies broad support by political grievances, but its, uh, but its hostility towards us and towards our values is limitless. Its purpose is to rid the world of religious plural, pluralism. It makes no distinction between military and civilian targets. The collateral damage is not in its lexicon. Man, that sounds like the devil, doesn't it? You know, the devil wants to, he really, he really wants to hurt God, but he can't. So he hurts what God loves, and that's his church. He hurts Christians. And then it goes on to say this. It says, we did not understand how grave this threat really was. And a lot of Christians don't either. Not 9-11, how lethal the devil is. And now we didn't just adjust our, we didn't adjust our policies and our plans and our practices to deter or to defeat it. And most Christians don't do it either. They don't make plans how to overcome the enemy's attacks. The test before us is to sustain unity of purpose and to meet the challenges now confronting us. Man, that sounds like a good playbook thing for the, for the church to do. Sustain unity in the church. We need to design a balanced strategy for the long haul to attack terrorists while at the same time protecting ourselves against future attacks. Man, isn't that what we should be doing against the devil? Not running from him. We ought not be hiding from him. And a lot of times the reason a lot of Christians get their tails cut off, like the incredible Mr. Fox. Paul is the only one that got it. The incredible Mr. Fox got his tail cut off. And the reason that a lot of Christians get their tail cut off, like Mr. Fox, is because they're out there all by themselves. You know, it's the bananas, the one that gets separated from the bunch is the one that gets peeled. Isn't that right? And you think of the, I, I, I don't know why, I must have liked these or watched one or two. I hate them. I hate these things, these nature videos that I get a lot of them on my feed. Uh, the, in Africa, uh, I hate to see an animal getting killed by another animal. I know it's the circle of life. I'm oh, it's the Lion King. I'm up on all that. But I just hate to see it. I hate to see that, you know, a, 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 a gazelle get taken down by a, a whole pride. And I don't mind seeing um, hyenas. I don't mind seeing them get beat up by lions. They're, they're kind of, they're just nasty. But think about it. You think about when there's a herd, when there's the, the gazelles or the zebras are running, which ones get gone? Which ones get taken down? The lions don't run through the middle of the pack till they get to the one in the middle. It's the ones on the fringe. They're the ones that get, they're the ones that get taken down. If the Christians are the ones that are on the fringe, they're not in where they're, they're not in the huddle. They're not in the small group. They're not in the church. They're the ones that again that are getting picked off. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Who's out there watching your back? Who's out there watching your back? Whose back are you watching? It's important. If you're not a part of a connect group, then I encourage you to, to be a part of a connect group. Now, truth, truth being told, I don't think we've got enough connect groups right now to house this many people in here. This is not all, our, this is not all of our church. We have some online. There's more that are here that are not here today. But we need more. 
We need more life group or connect group leaders. We need more host homes. Hey, I'm willing. My, I recognize that my home is not mine. It's, it belongs to the Lord. And if he wants to use it, he's welcome to use it. And if that's you, you're willing to be a host. Fill out a connect card. Say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to host. I'm willing to lead. A, our life groups, are, or I keep calling them life groups because I said that earlier in the message. Our connect groups are not rocket scientists. They're, they're, ours, as we've been watching the last few times, we've watched, we did a book. We did a couple of books. Christ the Healer, we did uh, Healing the Sick by T.L. Osborne. And then we've done uh, videos by Messenger Cup. Uh, we're, we're right now in one called um, oh, The Bait of Satan, which is Overcoming Offense. We're doing that one right now. And we have study lessons and we have questions. So we watch the video and we read the questions and we discuss them. It's not like you've got to have a seminary degree to be a life group leader, connect group leader. So again, if you will say yes to God, and your pastor, him first, me second. Well, I'm probably third or fourth down there. Your wife, your husband, but <laughs> might be a little higher. But anyway, listen, we need more groups. We need more, because I see the importance of them. They're so important again. We come to church, there's people, there's people that come to church and they've been going here for, I don't know, let's say they've been going here for five months. And I'm talking about one person in particular. Yeah, you turn around, but I'm looking at you. That's right. You don't, you don't, have to, don't have to say anything. I just want you to know I'm talking to you. I'm divulging a conversation that we had, okay? And she, I know she wouldn't care. I said to her, or she came up to me. She said, Pastor, I've been going here for a while. Remember this conversation? She says, it, but I just don't feel, I don't feel connected. And I said, two questions I always ask people. Are you in a connect group? And you're, are, and you're on a serving team. A serving team is a connect group, you know? Our, our, you know, and I, I, I will say this, and I, I probably should say this in training, in a, in a training of our leaders of over all of our ministries, but I'm just going to say it out here now so that we don't have to have a, another meeting. <laughs> I'm going to say it now. Like the, 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 the greeters, the GSM, I would encourage the GSM to have gatherings. Not always, just maybe once a quarter. Get all the GSM together so that you've got all your team together because all of you serve on, you know, uh, twice a month or something like that, and then you're in here. Our work, children's workers are the same. They, they don't work every week back there, thank God. In fact, I've asked Kim, who's our children's director, I've said, Kim, please, please, I want you in service at least, at least a minimum of once a month. And I don't know if she's done it yet. But she's, she's, she's committed to what she's doing. But I want people to be able to, to switch and to greeters and stuff like that. But get together in your, in your serving groups. You, you know, children's workers, uh, youth, youth leaders, you guys get together and be there for one another. Watch each other's backs. It's so important. But again, help us. Help us to grow a better, more effective uh, life group, connect group, ministry. Here at City Gate Church, we need more leaders and places to go. It's, it's not hard, okay? I love you guys. I appreciate you. Thank you for bearing with me today.